I've got the spots, the sickness, there's the twins in my brain. Primo Zeroglic is back in yellow. After an entertaining ride through France, the Slovenian was able to grab the win in his last preparation race towards La Grande Boucle, the Tour de France. Only eight seconds was the difference between winning and losing. Matteo Jurgensen saved Visma Lisebike from another catastrophic race. And you haven't even started talking about Ramco Evenepoel. You hear it. A lot of review after an eventful Criterium du Dauphiné. I'm here once again, joined by Ethan. Good evening. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good, mate. Are you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a busy couple of weeks as a preparation towards the tour. But yeah, it's, it's... we have a lot coming up, don't we? We have uh, yeah. obviously Tour de Suisse. We've had the Dauphiné finish, yeah. uh, which was both on the same day for domestic live, which is a stretch. <laughs> uh national championships coming up within yeah. the next week yeah. and a bit which is exciting as well did you enjoy last week's cycling action so the Dauphiné? yeah it was all, all the stages really were action from start to end i think and uh we got the proper nail biting finish didn't we yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's dive right into our Dauphiné review uh let's start off with the general classification of the podium Primoz Roglic was able to grab the overall win right in front of Matteo Jorgensen. And then maybe the, the surprise of the Dauphiné for me um, and for a lot of people, Derek G. Let's start with Primoz Roglic um, and his team, Bora Handgrohe in general. Um, what were your expectations for Roglic and the team before the Dauphiné? And did they succeed or did they overperform? Well, I'd say going into the race, I'd expect him to win. But obviously, if he had the best crash and obviously setbacks as before, should he have won over maybe like Remco? Oh, it's too hard to say. But if Remco does not get injured and have his setbacks, does he do the same as... Does he turn into a favourite? I don't know. Um, but yeah, Roglic... The team worked very well, I must say that. The team did excellent. That's the main reason he won. It's yes. roglification, isn't it? So yeah, I, I almost like Amazon Prime. <laughs> Just there isn't the, there isn't the race where Roglic doesn't crash, and he crashed uh, twice again um, in mm. the CS Dauphiné, um, two stages uh, right after each other, and the second one was the big crash where 50-ish riders um, hit the deck. But will he be happy after this Dauphiné? Of course, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? You won the, the Dauphiné, and but his shoulder—that's the issue. I don't know if his shoulder, so it's going to get looked at. I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So is. yeah, could not have a bit of a setback on him for the Tour de France, but the level—that's what I want to talk about—is was the level top top quality? I think if you poke a child here or finger God, you're just going to sit there and laugh at it, really. Yeah, um, I did uh, a domestic data uh, with the help of Dieter, um, the uh, the stage on Friday, and the data wasn't that interesting, that as impressive as we normally see in a Tour de France stage or something. Mm. So Dieter said Roglic has to step up if he wants to compete with a Pogacar um, in the Tour, but it's or still. Or, yeah, or God, if, but, if he is going, which I think going, yeah. it looks likely, I think. Yeah, he is going, but the, the question is how good will Vinny God be? Uh, mm, the start? Yeah. And like the start of the tour is in three weeks, uh, start in Italy. Um, in six weeks, we have the, a tough final weekend um, around Nice. So it's quite difficult to peak in this year's tour. It's not like you can ease into... Um, the tour, you have to be ready uh, right from the gun. Right to, uh, yeah. And that's maybe a disadvantage for the guys like Roglic and an Evenepoel and a Vinigo that they have to be 100% ready. Or isn't but it? But then in the middle bit, you have like a, like, like a sandwich, basically. You got one thing, like the, the bread, and then in the middle, it's just empty with the flat stages, which is, yeah. mm, and then the end bit is just. The end bit, I'll give him that. The end bit's actually quite tough. We saw a, a first glimpse of Vlasov as super domestique, uh, together with Hindley, Sobrero, 
that's it. Maybe one of the strongest teams that are going to line up in the tour, and they had a good general repetition, a good final exercise in this year, Dauphiné. I just want to talk about Vlasov. Um, kudos to him. Um, being a team leader, um, in every other team he's going to be leader, going on domestic duty for 100% in this Dauphiné. Mm. Yeah, kudos to Vlasov. He did an mm. exceptional job. Definitely, because you'd see before people had a reputation that he wouldn't work for people like Hindley, for example, or stuff like that. But yeah, we've seen in the end stages, he was just going all in, giving all effort, which was ma- uh, mad. Then, and then on the Magnus Court stage, I think as well, where he completely emptied himself there. Yeah. We've yeah. seen that. So yeah, it's that duo with Vlasov and Roglic is, I think, a great duo to watch out for. Is it the strongest team that's going to line up uh, at the tour well, after UAE of course yeah I was about to say UAE is basically like having the Galacticos of Real Madrid just lined up <laughs> next year but after UAE boo, after what happened to Visma Lisa bike I'd say it's maybe on par with them so Roglic won the Dauphiné um, only eight seconds difference with Matteo Jorgensen um, from Visma Lise bike. Jorgensen is an exceptional rider. He was already exceptional within Movistar, but he stepped up to Visma Lise bike right now, and it's like he can do everything. He can perform in the Cobble Classics um, spring season, and now after winning Paris Nice earlier this season, he almost wins Criterium de Dauphiné. Is Jorgensen a GC rider in the upcoming Tour de France, protected next to Vinigal? Yes, I'd say, yeah, uh, in my opinion, really. But we've seen Cusset level was not there at all in that Dauphiné, was it? Let's be honest. Um, and if Vingard, it's obviously like a wild card if Vingard doesn't feel 100%. So Jorgensen's level there in that Dauphiné, so close to winning. If he took the stage and being a bit of an arse, I think he should have took the stage. But hmm, it's... Yeah, I, he should have taken the stage, but I think that he had a he had a coalition with Rodriguez, yeah. and it, it was like Rodriguez pulled 100% as well. And probably if they didn't have that coalition, they wouldn't have won. Mm. Yeah. So I think kudos to Jorgensen to play it like that. He did what he could. But next to the performance from Jorgensen, um, we unfortunate things happened again. For a Visma Lise bike, we already mentioned it so many times this season. But the big crash um, took out Van Baarle and Kruiswijk. Um, they are both out for the Tour de France, for the upcoming Tour de France. That are another two important domestiques gone uh, for a leader. Where a question mark behind that as well, Vinigo. So, yeah, who's going to replace Kruiswijk and Van Baarle? Because Kruiswijk is a luxury domestique in the mountains and Van Baarle is overall great. Are they replaceable? Uh, Kruiswijk, I think, is replaceable in my opinion. But uh, Van Baarle is very hard to replace. Someone like Tim Van Dijk, maybe, is a possible replacement is something there. But, yeah, I'm not sure about Kruiswijk. Of course, can he do his domesticing? And his level is just, I don't, it's an enigma. I don't understand his level right now. No, me neither. His uh, individual time trial is always bad, but now it was exceptionally bad. And then he always got dropped pretty early on in the mountain stages. Um, it, it's not what we expect to see from a rider like Kuss. But the Kruiswijk and Van Barle injuries doesn't put more pressure on Wout van Aert to perform and to be yeah even more ready to get that domestique role yeah i think so because then he has to do it's got to be like the swiss army knife kind of thing doesn't isn't he really we've seen obviously before his tremendous mountain performances in the tour de france oh what stage is it was it in 2022 where he, he fell up in did that stage obviously he's won month yeah. and two hasn't he as well yeah. so yeah if he's ready which he does look like it I think yeah. he, that would be good. Yeah, I hope he's ready because uh, he probably will be ready for the first 10, uh, 14 stages. But it's all, I have a lot of question marks about the final week, the final weekend. I don't see 
Vinegar, Distance, Pogacar. Com- I, I don't know. I don't know how to preview the Tour de France. That's it, it's, the gravel st- it's the gravel stage. Uh, that could just completely yeah. just go whoop and then boom. Something, something's going to happen there. Then the final podium spot in general classification. Oh my God. Derek G is a GC rider. I don't, I don't, <laughs> know, what to, I don't know what to say. Like, uh, it's crazy. We have uh, seen um, Daryl Impey before the start of the last stage, I think it was. He compared him to Geraint Thomas, and I think that's actually. Yeah. It's actually a similar comparison to when uh, Geraint Thomas started out, really. Classics and that classic style, style. And then um, just like that, just fucking absolute demon. And that's all yeah. I can say, a demon. Yeah, he he lost some weight during um, off-season. Um, he's 26 right now, so he's coming onto the scene quite late. Um, mm-hmm. Ran to a debut, debut last year in the Giro was exceptional. I saw he was seven times um, in the break and finished four times second, if I recall correctly. And right now he made the next step. He climbed with the best in the Dauphiné. And it's not like the Dauphiné had a whack starting list. Yeah, I've seen um, his interview after one of the stages. He said, I was just not not, um, focusing on who's with me. I was looking down at my power unit, just like cross-eyed. And then he, after he looks at the results and he's like, what? I was doing that. <laughs> yeah, Israel Primitic, besides G, uh, yeah, we have to talk about Chris Froome. Um, he's probably going to the tour. What do you expect from him after what you saw in the Dauphiné? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh <laughs> no comment, but I'll give him his kudos. He is actually providing ex- uh, advice and stuff like that to Derek G, which I did see, which is very nice of him, isn't it? And there's also an advantage with G that he has someone like Chris Room within the team for the Tour de France because he's like a like a captain kind of thing, really, for him. But uh, his performance... <laughs> yeah, I have the, the GC... Uh, right in front of me. I don't know if you know where he ended up. If I make a guess. We had 94 finishes. 94 and he finished the race. Yeah. I'm going to say 92. <laughs> no, 81. Uh, on one hour, 28 minutes and 25 seconds. <laughs> he might battle for the Lante in the Rouge. <laughs> I mean, it's gonna actually going to be in a battle with a sprint up, up a climb, which is <laughs> very easy, but yeah. I, but, I'm not going to hate I, with him. No, me neither, but the guy, he's 39 years old, right? He has a contract for 2025. Mm-hmm. Isn't it time to hop in the in the DS car, stop yeah, racing and be a Team DS? I think so, but obviously... He's got that in him that he wants to just keep continuing, doesn't he? We've seen Israel took Daryl Impey in the day as a director, uh, sportif, and he's doing actually a very good job as well. I'll give him the credit for that. Chris Froome, just imagine him as a sporting director. I actually think it'd be very good. Yeah, me too. I think so he, he's made Why does he it. not do it? Ineos could do with someone like him, but Ineos um, in the Dauphiné was actually very impressive. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Like, um, and especially the last stage for me, um, yeah. Carlos Rodriguez, um, Ineos decided to pace um, early on in the stage because they wanted to make it as hard as possible because Rodriguez doesn't really have that punch, the explosivity. So mm-hmm. they had to get fatigue in the legs um, to be even be able to get the shot on the stage win, and they did it wonderfully. And the, t- the together, the duo with Lorenz de Plus, what the Dauphiné, the Belgian, had as well, was lethal. Um, and the team for the Tour looks pretty sexy as well, I have to be honest. Yeah, I think my pick for the third place, Carlos Rodriguez, 
I think he just likes it nice and gritty, dirty, doesn't he? The high pace. Yeah. But obviously, he doesn't pack the punch. So, yeah, I think him in third place, especially taking the confidence from this Dauphiné, I yeah. think definitely. I'm very interested to see what's Bernal going to do in the Tour de Suisse as well, because he's scheduled for the Tour de France as well, together with Pitcock, um, who's going to the Tour as well. And then Lorenz de Plus. Uh, so, yeah, that's a, a very strong mountain squad. Um, I would put Carlos Rodriguez as main man uh, for yeah, the team. Definitely. But Bernal, we can't count him out because he's shown already this season that he's growing towards his best ever form as well. We will see in Swiss, of course, um, if it continues. Um, one more thing about Ineos Grenadiers. Their god, the beast, the machine, Joshua Tarling. I think he only had three or four weeks of training before this Dauphiné. Um, his father mentioned um, on X, they had no expectations for the individual time trial. And he just casually finished second, uh, yes. if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, not that far away from Remco Evenepoel. But that wasn't the most impressive thing because in a mountain stage on the final climb, who did we see in a group of 20? Joshua Tarling. I looked, I was in the live there. I looked at it again. I was like, huh? Yeah. I looked again. I heard uh, Rob Hatch say, Joshua Tarling is there. Only just with his jacket done up. Yeah. I was like, what? How? If I recall correctly, Evenepoel was already dropped and Tarling right. was still in that yeah. group. So, nay. That's just the future for that guy is crazy. I don't know what his weight is, but I think that the absolute power that he had to produce to be able to stay in that front the group, it has to be astonishing. <laughs> Imagine he could see, if he could just see that. Oh, <laughs> I think Dieter uh, is going to bat straight away. <laughs> yeah, definitely knocked out straight away. <laughs> yeah, then we had in the, the first stage, we had Mats Pedersen um, winning. Um, we can't really say it was an easy win, uh, but there weren't a lot of sprinters present um, in this year's Dauphiné. Um, let's say there were no sprinters um, present. But still, uh, he took the stage win. Um, there was only one chance, and he, he took it um, 100%. Not only that stage win was impressive, but as well his domestique work during the Dauphiné um, on some climbs. He is ready, and for me, he's a contender for the green jersey in the Tour de France, and maybe one of the biggest favorites. Uh, Philipson wins it by a mile, I think. Mm. I think so. Let's be honest, he is, isn't he? Those, like, six, stage seven, around there, like, that middle bit, the stages are just boring. And I don't think Philip, uh, not, uh, I don't think Matt Pedersen has the speed to overcome Philipson. Yeah, I agree. Philipson is the, the main favorite, but I, but I was like, so Peterson will be close though. He's climbing like a madman. He's going for every, every intermediate sprint. He's going ham in every bench sprint. He's ready. He's always ready. Wout van Aert isn't really aiming for the green jersey, I suppose. Mm. So, yeah, it's Philipson main favorite, but Peterson is a very dangerous guy for the green jersey in nice i was going to say in paris but it's in nice <laughs> i keep forgetting that it's so doing my head <laughs> but yeah I mean, if milan was there i had milan i'd want to i'd pay money to see that that would be an all-time battle milan and philipson would just prove unfortunately i think he's targeting the olympics isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. little track had some yeah difficulties as well some bad luck um theo higgen hart um, crashed um, in that big crash as well and he had some problems with his ribs um, mm-hmm. that's not good three weeks before the tour um, he had a long recovery to be um, ready for the Dauphiné and, and to get the level he wanted to be he wasn't able to prove where he was um, condi- um, fitness wise what do you expect from the Brit um, in the tour? Uh, no expectations for him, really, I think. I think he's a bit 
unfair to apply expectations on him, in my opinion. He's a rider with a lot of bad luck, which is obviously going to take a toll on him, isn't it, as a person? Continuously get injuries and little niggles and stuff like that. So, yeah, no expectations for him. I think Shikone, on the other hand, I think Shikone very impressed me. He was like like uh, his compatriot, Tiberi, where they have like a ball to the wall sound and just, just basically scream F it and just go, yep, I'm going. Yeah, he lost three minutes, a little bit more than three minutes in the individual time trial. Um, so that's why he only finished um, eight um, in the general classification. Mm-hmm. But still, yeah, what a very impressive performance for Ciccone. And he showed balls. He, yeah, he dared to I attack. Like. And that's, yeah, like you mentioned, real cyclismo. That's, it is, yeah. Yeah. It's what you want to see. You don't want to see them just sitting around. You want to see them on the attack, on the offensive. Him and Tiberi, imagine if they went on the attack together. It'd yeah. be fireworks. Then stage two. I think it's time for your adoration. Uh, we all know <laughs> your love. For the Uno X Mobility team, take us through the final K of stage two. Uh, we had uh, Bruno Amarai obviously in front of the last kilometer. The fog, oh, that was a lot of fog, wasn't it? And then um, we had about five or six Uno X Mobility guys on the front, and they took it upon themselves to bring Amarai back because uh, otherwise he was not coming back, was he? Let's be yeah, honest yeah. there. Vlasov made a great effort as well to end earlier on. But yeah, Unirex took it up and delivered Magnus Court the victory through the uh, fog. You couldn't, I, I generally, I've not seen a uh, fog like that since I think Jay Vine won the world stage. Yeah, yeah. You literally couldn't see who it was. And then Primoz Roglic was second, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't recall who was third, but for Unirex, first ever Mateo world tour. Jorgensen was third. That's, that's impressive in itself, I think, as well, because yeah. it shows he packs a punch. But yeah, first ever World Tour victory for you. Know, How oh, ecstatic sure. were you? I had to remain neutral, non-biased, yeah. <laughs> and especially when it's Magnus Court as well. Magnus Court, everyone likes Magnus Court, don't they? Yeah, yeah. But what was so impressive, like, I was always with the idea Armin Rai is going to make it. Um, he was yeah so low cadence, but he was giving it all. And it was mm. like Vlasov didn't really close it but then you know X took it up but the acceleration from court like no one was able to stay close to him it was like from a sprint that, really isn't it probably like sprint esque two three seconds was bang boom and he was gone it was uh, just like his algorithm when where he just flipping went boom what's machine yeah. um but yeah and what impresses me the most is how uh you know X was having so many people in the finale yet again, which is, you see it a lot. And then uh, we also seen it in Dwarves Door he- Hagland, yeah. the Duracell thing race. But unfortunately, uh, Vermesh um, denied that. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, three of the five in the top t- five there, which is, again, impressive. Yeah. But the, we have to be honest, the long-term vision from Unix is extraordinary. Um, two to three years ago, um, they really started to step up and to increase um, good performances to perform very good. We, they started with a, a small core, but right now the team is preparing to be world tour ready within um, a certain amount of seasons. Um, they are head to head with a lot of destiny, um, maybe. We had some discussions in our server uh, on this. I court. don't understand. I do not understand how you can say. Uh, Lotto Destiny has been better than Unirex this season. It doesn't make any sense, but yeah. Because in terms of like the way Unirex race compared to Lotto, you know, Unirex is always on the offensive. But to be fair to Lotto, Lotto have uh, had uh, Maxine Van Hills, who is basically, let's be honest, carried them. I think we have the, the Unirex mobility has the, the teamwork, the attractiveness. Yeah. Um, they can win with multiple riders like Abrahamson, for example. And um, we have then Tiller, we have Kort. Um, within Lotto Destiny, we have some extraordinary personalities, riders. We have Van Eetveld, if he isn't injured, is very strong. Mm-hmm. Then we have a Maxim Hills, as you mentioned. Then we have Arnaud Delis, of course, who 
takes a lot of UCI points uh, for the team. So I think Lotto Destiny has maybe the slight advantage on individual rider performances, but mm. the overall team quality is better for you know X. The overall team, yeah. And also the outlook on the future for both teams. Yeah. Lotto, on the other hand, is going to be struggling with money, I think. I've read yeah. that as well today, I think. Yeah, the, um, the, the Destiny quits their sponsorship at the end of the season. So yeah, I, um, they called up some guy all the way up, I think, to the main pro team for next season. I don't recall who, but yeah, I'm, some guy was saying that they must be having money issues, which yeah. I think is there. But you know, X well, definitely probably don't have money issues, I'll be honest there. So maybe for our listeners, um, in the comments, who's the better team? Which team is better? You know, X or... Lot of destiny. That way, we can avoid further discussions in our Discord channel. Uh, and we yeah, can move because on. <laughs> and they can watch out for some transfers next season. I see what I'm saying. They can have a look. <laughs> then uh, the individual time trial. Remco Evenepoel uh, wins in an impressive way while being 90% fit, 95% fit. That means the guy is exceptionally strong on a time trial bike we already knew that but still that was very impressive and i didn't expect it to be honest i had my money on roglic that day i expected a lot from roglic in that time trial because i didn't know how good even pool was to be fair and i would not i was actually expecting tarlin to win in all honesty really really yeah i think because roglic uh, with time trial over the Montelisari is a bit of a... Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Remco, that just shows, isn't it, that his, his peak, peak level in time trial is, is just flipping insane. Yeah, it's insane. But then the, the three days after the mountain stages, it showed that he's not ready yet uh, for the Tour de France. He was dropped quite early on in most of the mountain stages. The maturity, the, though. The positive is that he's not... Yeah, he didn't really have a parqueggio. He already was able... He was able to keep his speed, his power um, quite high. So he only lost one minute, one minute and a half. There are a lot mm-hmm. of riders, they completely drop off and they, are, they aren't able to produce some power. But he was able to keep those pedals turning. So maybe he saw it as extra training because he knows... He need that race rhythm, that they yeah, had that that hardness, that toughness. But pff, will he be ready in Italy? Uh, I think it's a bit too quick, come quick, in my opinion. I think he should just go stage hunting. But like the maturity of Remco over the past year, I think he's developed a lot as a person as well. Um, we're not seeing his like aggressive. Uh, young self are as well we're seeing him being honest in his interviews saying where his mistakes are and stuff like that but yeah also to keep the gaps at where they were when he got dropped and not completely capitulate it's yeah I'm interested to see what Sudal Quickstep is going to do because they had bad luck as well with Elon Van Wilder who's the luxury domestique for the Evenepoel and who's who didn't perform in the um, Dauphiné as well. And then we have Mikael Landa as well. He was able to hold on with the GC group a bit longer than Evenepoel did, but wasn't that impressive um, either from Mikael Landa. So I think Quick Step, Sudal Quick Step will have some question marks going into the tour, but no doubt that Evenepoel is the main leader, of course. Obviously, uh, but... Can they use Lande if Remco just completely just blows up? I think they could probably maybe get away with it. The problem is Lande doesn't have a time trial. Yeah, and that's the issue. And the end, the end bit. Oh. Yeah, and it's like if you have a GC rider four or five years ago when Bernal won, um, then it wasn't really necessary to be a beast in time trialing, but with the riders now, with Vinigo, with a Pugacha, with even a pool, those guys are world top, world class in time trialing. So 
um, being a Lambda or even being a Banal, you lose one minute, two minutes um, in a flat time trial. Good luck making that up in the mountains. Uh, Remco for that last TT, I think, is a banker, I think, in my opinion. That's what I'm going to say there. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Well, with Pogaccia, you never know. I still, I still think he beats him, but um, I don't think he's... I can't like, watch stuff like that. It's too too close to cool. Like Pogacar, same for him. His time trials in the Giro, he was able to compete with Pippo Gana. Uh, he mm-hmm. won the first time trial, a real bit um, a lot of altitude meters in that time trial. But the the time trial around the Como Lake, if I recall correctly, that was mm-hmm. almost pan flat, mm-hmm. and he was able to compete with Gana there as well. So on a flat time trial. Pogacar is phenomenal as well. Uh, his level in time travel is crazy. I just... Uh, it's un- indescribable to describe him, isn't it? Because he just... He does something that just blows your mind every time. He, he can even sprint nearly now as well, which is just okay. stupid. Then uh, we move on to the dark page um, of this Criterium du Dauphiné. Um, stage 5... Um, the stage between Ampluy and Saint Priest was cancelled after a mega crash. Uh, 50 ish riders went down. It was like a stop on the road. I saw riders mm. slide like I never saw before. Um, Usain Bolt runs 100 meters and we saw riders slide for 100 meters plus. A lot of DNFs uh, because of that, quite a bit of injuries, bruises. Um, I think we have to bridge immediately to the safety um, aspect of cycling. Does our sport have a safety problem? Yeah, I think it does have a safety problem, doesn't it? Because what protection did those guys have against serious injuries? The helmets, I don't know if everyone's seen the image of the helmets you can see. Helmets like with the paint off and everything yeah. like that. Uh, the conditions that uh, I seen Patrick the Furby's tweet saying it was not organized at all. The rain just came out of nowhere, and within five minutes, it was like that. So, what can they do about it? That's the, the main thing. I don't know. Like, I had a, a discussion about it with Hannes, um, and he mentioned when something unexpected happens, like last week. Um, then the race jury has to act immediately and safety car it like the the red car in front just let them slow down um, and restart after the dangerous section is over that's, that's a good idea of, of I mean, course that's... in theory it's easy to say but yeah what what are you going to do with the brake and the gap between the brake and the peloton how are you going to reinstate it after the dangerous part but i think we can both agree something has to change because those riders there's always 150 riders plus in the peloton who just ride 60 70 k's an hour in a downhill in a swimsuit um they have no protection in their clothes and yeah Imagine being a parent when you see that crash and you don't know how your son or daughter um, is doing. It's yeah, it's insane and it happens so much this year. Why does it happen more this year than this year than other years? What's what's changing? In your opinion? I've seen this is not my opinion, but I've seen some people on X. They say because like Roglic is another GC contender, so then they have more people at the front competing and shit like that. Is the size of the peloton too big as well? That's and I think maybe they're a bit too big. I think they should maybe slightly reduce it by like a few riders. That is, and I think a lot of the problems will be solved. Yeah, if, in my opinion, it's a combination of several things first of all it's the the equipment um the bikes we had to change from rim brakes to disc brakes um that creates that uh, the peloton can brake later for a dangerous corner or dangerous section then we have the two trings um they go bigger and bigger um we see in time trials uh, 
the bigger the touching, the yeah, the faster you go um, in theory. But it's the same for a normal stage. Um, do they have to be able to put pressure on the pedals when they are already over 90k of or over 80k? I had a discussion with Hannes as well, and I say they have to. I said they have to limit it. Um, Hannes says that's not possible and that's yeah not a good solution. But I think why that's do... un unenforceable, yeah. isn't it? It's like it's not really not really like it's not really the M1 motorway in England where you have a speed limit. You can't really limit that. Um, uh, you, you can need... do like like the the youth categories that you have a limit on tutoring. Like and you make it big. Um, that it doesn't really influence the race, but you you create that they are not able to be even faster when they are already over 80 k an hour, and I yeah, that's maybe I something. I think personally, can... the um the skin suits. I think that's where the safety comes into play in terms of what they can do. Uh, a good comparison, MotoGP. I don't know if people see that. Where the guys just fall off here yeah, and just with this with their suits, they literally just walk off it like it's nothing half the yeah. time. When yeah. you don't have a single graze or anything like that. Maybe the same technology as that. Would it make them slower? It would, obviously, yeah. But that's the um, risk versus reward, is it kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. And if you oblige it for every rider, every team that is the same for everyone. So it doesn't really yeah. So it's if not going to be slower, an advantage, yeah. Yeah, if it's slower, it's slower for everyone. So, And that's the equipment part. And the other side, we have the behavior of the peloton. It, yeah, riders are becoming more and more aggressive, maybe. They all want to be at the front. They don't want to lose time. Maybe there are more teams that want to be at the front. Um, is it maybe an ID? Um, it doesn't really have to do uh, with the crash we saw in the Dauphiné, but to... To change the 3k rule to a 5k rule or a 7k rule to pull the the gc riders faster out of the the sprinting i still think if you have, if you if you keep moving the five kilometer rule back you, and stuff like that three kilometer rule back you're gonna keep getting the same pinch point kind of thing aren't you really yeah. but just like delay it further down the line so would that change anything no but also race organizers need to take into safety into their hands as well better and the UCI needs to work better because you do see some absolutely stupid designs sometimes like how people are allowing that to happen. But uh, road surfaces as well. We've seen that road surface was freshly laid tarmac and it was literally turned into like an NHL rink, which is proof. Yeah, but it's... Is circuit racing starting to become a thing? Is it uh, too difficult to create uh, and to organize races on public roads with the road furniture there is, with the speed bumps? Um, is it still uh, possible to yeah, drive through city centers um, and pay for yeah, the passage? It comes, down to, it, it comes down to money at the end of the day, doesn't it, unfortunately? Like a lot of things, if people were going to pay for it, I guess it's going to always be the case, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. But and, and as well, like you already mentioned, the race organization has to adapt maybe a bit quicker and yeah, have to look more into rider safety because we had now the Dauphiné was unexpected, but we had that stage in the Giro um, where the race was um, shortened after a lot of discussion between the CPA um riders and uh, the Giro organization so safety has to be priority for for me for all races going forward um we will the answer that we always hear crashing is part of the sport it shouldn't be like that no, should it, it, it should not be like that yeah. because it takes like another serious injury and then people are just going to still say the same thing, aren't they? It's like, well, do something about it rather than just sit there and say, oh, well, keep discussing about it. Yeah. Like we only had uh, the crash from Gino Meder. Um, I think it's one year ago, um, exactly, or two days or three days ago. It was mm -hmm. uh, exactly one year. 
So, and since then, uh, we had someone who died in the, yeah, doing the sport he loves, doing the job he loves, but it didn't change. Gino made it, didn't, didn't change a thing, sadly, and that's a pity to see. It's uh, uh, well, just like sit and twiddle the fingers, doesn't don't they? Like, do action rather than keep discussing it because it's going to cause even more issues down the line. But I must give credit to the CPA. The CPA are doing a good job as well in yeah. fighting in fighting this yeah. um, and fighting for rider safety. I've seen it very numerous times already this season and previous season as well. Yeah, and besides the the injuries um, that that crashes causes, there were only only 94 finishers in the Dauphiné, and we had 154 starters. It's not like it's a positive thing for the race organization as well, and for the race in general. If you lose, um, yeah, big GC men, um, then yeah, the fight is over as well. So for attractiveness of the race, it's bad as well. Yeah, and then obviously comes into account when people choose if they want to ride it next year, for example, and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the Dauphiné, I don't, and there's nothing they could have really done, I'll be honest, changing yeah, it, yeah, yeah. but it's not okay. their fault. So, um, But the abandons, I've never seen that many abandons. In, uh, it's like a COVID race, basically, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I had to think about that COVID zero, uh, if I recall correctly, where a lot of people abandoned due to COVID. But right now, I wasn't on the live, the last stages, but I was looking at the thread and I was just seeing another abandon, another abandon, another abandon. And then I saw you guys mentioning in the in the group chat, this is getting insane. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was a pity to see. Um, then we move on. I wanted to talk about um, our KOM winner as well. Um, I wanted to mention him, Lorenzo Fortunato. Why? Um, he participated in the Giro and finished the Giro before going to the Dauphiné. Um, that's an interesting combination. I wouldn't really do um, as a rider or I wouldn't plan as a, a manager. It didn't work, but, did it, for uh, Tiberi? Yeah. Tiberi, he, it, didn't, it completely capitulated. So Fortunato, respect him. Yeah, was a, a, yeah I wanted to mention uh, the guy from Astana, Kazakhstan team. Then you have a, I have a couple of names written down. We already talked about Vinigard, uh, Jurgensen, that duo um, leadership maybe for the tour. But then we have Pogacar Ayuso as well. Um, we don't know how good Pogacar is going to be after the Giro. I think we can both agree he will be um, good. He will be exceptional. But you never know. A Giro tour double isn't easy at all. Um, so it's not like the race is already won. He has had uh, Ayuso. Um, next to him as co-leader, maybe. Um, Machin mentioned something else, of course, but still, I think Ayuso is more a core leader, co-leader than a domestique. But he crashed in the Dauphiné on both hips. Um, will it have an influence on the, his preparation towards the Tour? I think so, because uh, you've seen him in the aftermath of that incident, and he, he, like, he couldn't really even put weight down on it himself. Um, and then I see in the uh, AS X account, they posted him in Spanish with a translation. I don't recall what it said, but it was something along the lines of like um, his hips, obviously. Yeah. yeah. He mentioned he he crashed in that uh, slight party, um, but then he, he was scared of the riders um, coming behind him. So he wanted to stand up um, as fast as possible, but he was still. Yeah, moving too fast, so he he fell again um, on his other hip, so that's why his both hips are uh, are injured, um, were hurting. He they decided last minute to withdraw from the race, so he he slept, um, and then he even signed um, the start uh, list at the start of the stage, but then right before the start, he decided to withdraw, and because mm -hmm. it wasn't possible uh, with the hips. I have a, a feeling it might be a little bit out of precaution um, as well, maybe. There, there, he will be injured, it will hurt, but the weather was bad as well. So maybe they didn't want to take more risks and give him the rest he needed um, for the tour. Especially when it's like your hips as well. You wanted us 
really just rest yourself as much as possible. And the weather for that entire Dauphiné was yeah. flipping awful, horrible. And it's been like that in June for eight. In June, I don't understand. Yeah, it's the weather in general uh, in Belgium as well is crap. It's cold, cold and rainy, horrible rain. Yeah. I don't know if there are other riders you want to mention um, before we end the, the, this Dauphiné re- review. Um, I want to talk about Abrahamson very briefly about what he did. Yeah, and the Belgian races were very entertaining, wasn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you caught up with them. We had Brussels Cycling Classic where Abrahamson won yeah. uh, beautifully. Um, what else was the other race? Franco Belge. That yeah. was a great race with Gemai. Um The parkour was very enjoyable and there. Um, also, I want to give a short shout out to TDT Unibet, the greatest team apart from Unix, <laughs> first ever <laughs> professional podium with Hartis de Vries. I probably butchered the Dutch name, but yeah, it's pretty incredible for them, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, one last question before we end um, this review Who has given your best impression for the Tour de France? Um, for the general classification within this Dauphiné peloton, who can compete for the yellow jersey? And no one is in the answer. Derek G. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Roglic, I'm not really, not really at the level. It's up in the air, isn't it, really? Jorgensen, I'll go with Jorgensen. How about you? Uh, I think Carlos Rodriguez, Rodriguez will be close. It's between, yeah, close between them two, I'd say, in my opinion. And Mads Pedersen will give you that from the sprints and things like that. <laughs> Mads Pedersen for green, write it down. Yeah, he's, he looks super strong. And the, the pool one, I think, stage eight, it's flipping crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's a wrap for today's Domestic Cycling Podcast. A big thank you to our audience for t- tuning in. If you enjoyed the episode, consider supporting us on Ko-Fi. The link is in the description. And if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe and turn on notifications. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you next time for the Tour de Suisse review. See you later. Goodbye. I've got the sparse, the sickness. There's the twins in my brain. <laughs>